Well, I want to talk to you in the second message in this series called Do Good. I want to talk to you about living a good life story, writing a good life story. And I've been highly concerned as we've done some promotion and talking with people about this that no one ever think we're talking about goody, goody two shoes. That's not what we're talking about. Listen, this is very important because as I was getting dressed this morning, I was praying about this again. And I said, Lord, I really don't want people anywhere to think that we're trying to talk about how good we are. And this thought came to me this morning. Friends, if you find anything good in our lives, it's because of Jesus Christ. And the imprint that we hope to leave is not the imprint of Woodland or not the imprint of my life or your life, but we want to leave witness and testimony to the goodness of our all eternal loving God. Can we give him another hand of praise this morning? That's what this is all about. And we looked at a biblical case last week. We went through the scriptures, a biblical case of why we should live good lives. We're not saved by doing good. And we built, we're building this series off the series of hope that we talked about, where hope is not a wishing, but hope is an assurance based upon the character, the goodness, and the promises of God. I see the goodness of God manifested in so many places. A couple of years ago on Fox News, there was a story that just kind of touched my heart. And the, you see these stories that touch your heart all the time. This 93-year-old woman was making a flight by herself. She, had, she was very frightened. She was very afraid. And when she got on board the plane, she just confided to the young man sitting next to her. She says, I'm really frightened about this flight. And uh, she said, do you mind holding my hand? 93 years old. Imagine a total stranger saying, would you mind holding my hand? And some of the passengers could hear, and they, of course, were watching. One passenger was taking pictures and sent it to Fox News. And the young man took her hand and held her hand while they took off, and then they chatted. And when they got up in the air, they hit some turbulence, and he reached over and put his arm and hugged her and said, it's going to be okay. When they landed, he helped her off the uh, off the plane, got her into a wheelchair, stayed with her until she could reunite with her daughter that she thought was her sister, not her daughter, and, but stayed with her all the way. And I remember them saying on Fox News, there are still angels out there. And that really stuck with me because you know what the word angel means. Angel means messenger. In the book of Revelation, when it says, write to the angel of the church, He's talking about the pastor. The pastor is a messenger to the church. So you can tell everybody this week, your pastor is an angel, okay? Whether, you know, I'm a fallen angel saved by grace, but it, it, that's the deal. It means messengers, and there are still messengers out there, and you are the messengers. And so that's what I want you to really grab hold of this morning. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3, the Bible says, you show, you you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And let me come back to what I said at the beginning, that if you see anything good, it's Christ in us that you see. Notice this. You show that you're a letter from Christ, not a letter from Pastor Clant, not a letter from Woodland Church, but you are a letter from Christ being written by the Spirit of the living God, the same God who worked in the life of Daniel, the same God that worked in the life of Paul. This God is at work writing an epistle in your life. This week I read a news article that kind of caught my, my attention just simply because of Elon Musk's name. Elon Musk was being interviewed on the Christian satire site, Babylon B. How many of you have heard of Babylon B before? I, I, I know you have because a lot of you send me little cartoons or things from that. Well, Elon Musk was being interviewed on that. And in the course of the interview, he said, and let me read to you. He said, I really believe and agree with the teachings of Jesus Christ. Things like turn the other cheek are very important as opposed to an eye for an eye. An eye for an eye leaves everyone blind. Forgiveness is important, and treating people as you wish to be treated, love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, I thought two things. This is kind of cool that the Babylon Bee got an interview with one of the world's most powerful influencers currently at the moment, Elon Musk. The second thing was, just like we said last week in the first message, people agree with the teachings of Jesus Christ 
But then in the interview, they went on and said, would you do us a solid? Would you give your life to Jesus? Would you give your heart and life to Jesus? And Elon Musk said something that whether it was sincere or whether it was just cavalier, off the cuff, will time will only tell. Elon Musk says, if Jesus is saving people, then sure, I want to be one of them. And I think that's the question we're all asking ourselves. Is Jesus saving people? Because there's never enough good works that I can do to save myself. There's never enough of a good life I can live to save myself. Years ago, I brought a tall ladder out here on the, on the uh, platform, and I illustrated what had been said that Billy Graham said if Mother Teresa was, he t- used the top of the ladder as the holiness of God, if Mother Teresa said she was maybe about here and the ladder went all the way to that top beam, if Mother Teresa said she was about here, Billy Graham said he was about here, and the person he was talking to says, well, I wouldn't even be on the rung then if that's the way goodness is ranked. You see, none of us are good enough to save ourselves. You see, without the grace of Christ, and I want you to hear it because this is so important. Without the grace of Christ, without the love of Christ, without the blood of Jesus shed at Calvary that we just celebrated and receiving communion together, there is no salvation. There is no regeneration. And without regeneration, friends, then all of our attempts at goodness are limited and our lives are limited. But if you bring in the blood of Jesus, if you bring in the sacrifice of Christ, faith in his name and in his resurrection, and the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, regeneration becomes possible. Now, get that word, regeneration, regeneration. A generation, a new life, the power of God's new life is in us being written by the Spirit of the living God. Can we give him a hand of praise for that this morning? That's where the source and the power of goodness comes to. So in your outline this morning, the truth of Christianity is witnessed and ministered to and seen in our lives by the story of our lives, by our life stories. You see, the truth of Jesus, it's in this Bible. The truth of Jesus is all in the Word of God. The power of God is here. But the witness to that Word in a culture that's not reading the Bible In a culture where many people are trying to attack the veracity of the Bible, it is the inspired, all-sufficient Word of God. In other words, you don't need any other book for the Bible to accomplish in your life what it will do. I'm not against books. I read wide. The Apostle Paul says, bring me my books. He read wide. But the book is all-sufficient. But the witness to what God says in this book is being witnessed to by you and I. Tom Landry said, the job of a football coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they've always wanted to be. Let me read that to you again. The job of a football coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they really want to be. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing in our hearts because let's be honest, There are times when all of us don't want to be good. There are times in all of our lives when we just, something wells up inside of us and we don't want to forgive. We don't want to give. We don't want to help. We we get insulted and so we lash out rather than forgive and show grace. And the job of a football coach is to take each individual, now listen, this is important, each individual on that team and make them do what they don't want to do in order they can become the tight end or the running back, the tight, whatever it is, that they can become what they want to be because when every one of them become what they really want to be, the football team can do great things. And it's important that you hear this because as much as I believe in the local church that it is the hope of the world The church is made up of individuals like you and you and you and me as we go out into the world and each one of us are living letters written by the Spirit of the living God. 
It's very interesting when you read my, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible, Romans chapter 12, how individualistic, and I had a conversation with someone this week who said to me down in Georgia, a friend who says, you know, I think our country's becoming too individualistic, and I agree, but each individual has to do their part for our country to be what it's supposed to be. Each individual in a marriage, each individual in a company, each individual in a church. And Romans 12 says, I, I'm, I'm imploring you, I'm begging you, I'm impel, compelling you, present your bodies as living sacrifices that you, individuals, may prove what is the good and the acceptable and perfect will of God. Sometimes life circumstances are not very favorable to that. Daniel's family was probably murdered. His home was destroyed and burnt to the ground. Daniel was probably, and I don't mean to be crass, but probably was emasculated, he and the three Hebrew children. Daniel was taken as a slave as a young man to the place that no Jew wanted to be, and that was to Babylon. But there, Daniel lived a life story, a good life story, that even when people assaulted his character, and even when people said bad things about him, even when you can read in the book of Daniel how he dreams about home, what he thinks about home, his family, you can read it all there. His heart pines for home. His heart longs for that restoration that he knows is going to come as he reads the prophecies of Jeremiah. Daniel, who nothing went right for in his life in those early years, he still sought to serve God. And sometimes serving God puts you in a place where you're not very appreciated. How many of you have discovered that to be true? Sometimes serving God puts you in a place where you're mocked or you're ridiculed, taken advantage of. And same thing had happened for Daniel. He had done his work with just such incredible integrity. Would you stand with me out of respect for the word of the Lord? And let me read you these few short verses. Daniel is accused. Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. Even our culture knows the story of the lion's den. He's lied about. He's taken advantage of because of his faith, because he won't stop praying. And so we pick up the story after spending the night in the lion's den. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. Now, you may say, well, he's the king. He could have stopped it. Well, sometimes, even as some of our presidents had discovered, you're bound by law. And there was nothing the king could do because somebody had appealed to his pride and to his ego, and he made a law based out of his ego. So very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out, in anguish. And in the Hebrew, that's, that's a word with great feeling. You can feel that, in anguish. Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? You have no idea how many people are asking you that question right now during this time of pandemic we're going through. Daniel answered, long live the king. He didn't curse the king. He wasn't mad at the king. King may have been a Democrat. He wasn't mad at him. King may have been a Republican. He wasn't mad at him. He just said, long live the king. My God, hallelujah. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent at his sight. And I have not wronged you, your majesty. Well, the king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den and not a scratch was found on him for he had trusted in his God. And then the king gave, then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel and he had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children and the lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. Ecclesiastes 5, 18, please remain standing. It's good for people to eat drink and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life God has given them to accept their lot in life and it's a good thing to receive wealth from God and the good health to enjoy it to enjoy your work and accept your lot in life this is indeed a gift from God God keeps such people so busy enjoying life they take no time to brood over the past would you read that last phrase with me take no time to brood over the past. Would you read that again? 
Take no time to brood over the past. Look at your neighbor and say that this morning. Take no time to brood over the past. Father, we ask you now just for the spirit of illumination from the Holy Spirit to help us take from this story how we can write a good life story. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. You can be seated. If you go all the way back to the beginning of the book of Daniel, you'll find out that Daniel and his friends were, they created a godly life plan. They created a godly life plan. It's what God calls upon each of us to do. No matter where you're at in life, that you create a life plan for how you want to spend your life and use your life for the glory of God. Even though they had seen their hopes dashed and damaged, and I don't have time to go into all of the implications that had, that would have had upon them, they still had hidden the word of God in their heart. They had the prophecies of Jeremiah. They had the writings of Solomon, and they knew even though they missed home and they longed for the restoration of Jerusalem, it never pays to brood over the past. Romans 8.39 has always been one of my great life statements. And what Romans 8.39 teaches me, there is absolutely nothing, and I love the way Peterson translates this in the message, there's absolutely nothing that can get between me and God's plan for my life. There's no angel, there's no devil, there's no demon, there's no power in hell that can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. The only serious mistakes that we make in life is when we give up on God. Oh, we make mistakes that can be recovered from. We make mistakes all the time because we, we make decisions out of fear. We make mistakes, mis, uh, decisions out of anger. Sometimes we make mis, uh, decisions out of misinformation that we receive. But we can always recover from those, from those kinds of decisions. But it's important to remember this. Sometimes Christians get too busy in the minutia of the Word of God, maybe of prophecy and what's happening in the Middle East, or maybe in prophecy and what's happening in the political sex, uh, uh, section of the newspaper as it concerns the United States. Maybe we get too interested in the minutia of life rather than remembering that each of us are a living letter. Boy, when I pray, I can see things happening in Chile or Argentina. When I pray, I can see things that happen in Washington or in Moscow. When I pray, I am confident that God is hearing my prayers and answering my prayers. But on a large-scale scope, there's not a lot I'm going to do about Washington or Moscow or any of that stuff, but there's a lot I can do about living life with you, living life with those online, and living lives here in my community. Ecclesiastes 7.4 says this, a wise person thinks a lot about death while a fool thinks only about having a good time. In my life, I have found that because of my health, I've always constantly thought about death. It's something that's always been on my mind. And during the month of December, I did eight funerals eight very difficult and challenging funerals to have to do just in the, the month of December. So death is never very far from my mind at all. But notice what the Bible says. A wise person thinks a lot about that because one day this body is going to quit working. One day this body will just simply exhaust itself and immediately I will go into the presence of the Lord and one day your body will quit working. And if I live my life thinking about only having the next party or the good time, then I'm never going to leave the kind of story behind that will remain a living letter that hopefully, hopefully, I'm certainly not putting myself in this category, but hopefully will have so much of the living Holy Spirit of God upon it, it will be like the body of Elijah that when a soldier was thrown in his bones, life came back to it. You say, well, pastor, that's impossible. It wasn't in the Bible, and I don't expect anybody to be thrown on my bones, but I hope a sermon that I preached or a YouTube video that's out there or a story I've written is going to touch somebody's heart and bring them to know Jesus Christ. And that the story of my life with all of its flaws and with all of its failures will still point to the amazing plan that God is writing on my life, on your life. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 14, our people must learn to spend their time doing good in order to provide for real needs. They should not live useless lives. Friends, underline that. Our people, Paul is writing to young pastor Titus. He said, Titus, you've got to teach the churches to spend their time doing good. Not spend their time frivolously, not spend their time wasting their lives, not chasing the next buck, but 
living, doing good in order to provide for real needs. Now, we know from Paul's teaching, he's talking about your time, he's talking about your talent, he's talking about your treasure, and he's talking about your testimony, your life story. And we're going to break all of that out in this series of how Paul taught that, how the Bible leaves that for the Word of God, as, as the Word of God for us, that God is saying to you and me, do good with your time, your talent, your treasure, and your testimony. That's what God calls upon each of us. And if you spend your life any other way, then you're living a useless life. Now, does that mean that you can't enjoy a football game? Oh, no, beat Bama. Beat them real bad. That's doing good. Can somebody say Amen. Last week, a little girl came to me after church, and she said, Pastor, I'm so upset that Georgia beat Michigan. I promised myself I wouldn't talk about this, but sometimes I can't help myself. I said, well, I, I wish I could say I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. She said, well, I want you to know I'm pulling for Alabama. I want them to beat Georgia now. Such immaturity, such immaturity. <laughs> You see, no, it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy football. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy a party. But you spend your life doing good with your time, your talent, your treasure, and your testimony. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 5, those who are wise will find a time and a way to do what is right, for there is a time and a way for everything, even when a person is in trouble. Now, don't raise your hand. And maybe online this morning, just think about this. Are any of you in trouble right now? Has COVID affected your home? Have your finances suffered? Or is your health in trouble? Is your marriage in trouble? Is your job in trouble? Listen to what the Bible says. Those who are wise will find a time and a way. Will find a time and a way to do what is right. For there is a time and a way for everything, even when a person is in trouble. This week, I will be blogging. If you want to go to my site, DennisClanton.com, and I will be blogging about this, how we create a life plan in times where it's just so unpredictable right now. The second thing I want you to see is my treasure flows to wherever my heart is. My treasure flows to wherever my heart is. Jesus taught us this principle when he says, wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Wherever your treasure is, see, my, my, my treasure will flow where my heart. My heart, if my heart is in heaven, my treasure is going to flow there. If my heart is in my marriage, my treasure is going to flow there. If my heart is in my family, my treasure is going to flow there. If my heart is in, is in this congregation, this church, in this community, my, my treasure will flow wherever your heart is. Your checkbook is a great way of evaluating where your treasure is. Your calendar is a great way of evaluating where your treasure is. Your, your, the way you build friendships Long, long ago, Becky and I were talking about this last night before we went to sleep. We're kind of just going over the service today, and, and I said, you know, in so many ways, Becky, what I'm preaching in this series is what you and I wrote down in 1978 in Columbus, Georgia together. So going back and look at all those notes that we made of the kind of life and the life vision that we wanted to have in our marriage and the ministry. And I says, we're, li we're, we're preaching what we've really lived out of and lived from. And one of those decisions was we knew because we had been taught this, that the longer a person is a Christian, the fewer lost friends that they're going to have. Right now, I have more invitations from lost people for lunches during this COVID crisis than I do from people that are Christians because you take time building and cultivating those relationships. We have to deliberately cultivate those relationships. And so when I get back and I download my email yesterday from Georgia and I download my email, there's invitations from friends that are not Christians, from friends that are other religions, from, from friends that are nominal. By, by nominal, I mean they've never really committed their lives to Christ. And you cultivate. You say, why? Because my treasure is there. God loves lost people. And in your circle... In your circle, are there lost people? Because <clears throat> wherever your treasure is, wherever your heart is, that's where your treasure of time and talent and finances. And you say, Pastor, have you been able to do this? Number one, Becky and I wrote down years ago, all that we have has been given to us by God. Genesis 4, 19 says that the heavens and the earth belong to God. All that I have has been given to me by God. 
In second, excuse me, in Philippians chapter four, in verse 19, the Bible tells us that all that I've needed has been promised. All that I needed is God will richly supply everything that I need to do his will. God will richly supply what I need to live out a good life, to build a godly life plan. And then Luke chapter 6 and verse 38 in the parables of the service, God tells me that all that I do for his glory will be rewarded. This is an old youth pastor sermon, in case you haven't picked up on that already. That all that I do will be rewarded. And then finally, Revelation 20 tells me that all that I've done, I will be accountable for because I will stand before the Lord and my works will be judged and so will yours. So it's why Paul says to another young pastor in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 18, listen, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so they may experience true life. Let me ask you a question this morning. How rich are you? Now, just stop and think for a moment. Have you ever thought about that? How rich are you? A friend of mine called me while I was home in Georgia, and we didn't have time to get together, but... He said, I still remember some of the stories that you told about your first trip to Africa and the poverty. He says, it changed our lives. It changed how we spent our our time and, and our investments and our resources. Another friend called me, and we did have a chance to get together. He just happens to be in that top 10% of the nation's income bracket, and we did happen to get together. It had been an uber, uber successful individual. He shared with me about what they've done in their church because I've had influence in their life and I I want them to know you're going to be held accountable for how you've used and what God has given you with. Life is not all about creature comforts. And then I had a chance to talk with another friend that he said, are you sure this tithing thing is right? Because when his income got to six figures, tithe was suddenly a whole lot different than it was when I first met him and he first gave his heart to Christ and he was only making eighteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year. And he looked at me across Chinese food and says, are you sure this six figure, this tithing thing is right? I'm making six figures now. And I said, I tell you what, I'm going to pray that God takes you back to $18,000 where you were happy to tithe. Don't do that, pastor. How rich are you? Because you see, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he walked away from Jesus because Jesus looked into his heart (coughs) and realized that money was his God. And that man walked away because he was sorrowful, he was rich. And I realized that young man never had ice cream. That young, young man never went to the refrigerator to get a glass of cold water. That young man never slept on an inner spring mattress, a sort of mattress that feels like heaven to lay down upon. That young man never drove in a car. That young man never flew in an airport. Should I go on? That young man hasn't experienced what people in our nation experience every single day. And when I read what Paul is saying here, that, you know, to live and to write a good life story, one of the things we have to be is generous Then the question becomes, what keeps me from being generous now? I hope that what you're hearing from the results of the joyful noise offering, it excites you and it thrills you because somewhere somebody is having a home built for them in the nation of Nepal. They will have walls and windows and a front door and a foundation and a shelter over their heads. There are children drinking cold, clean water and taking cold showers or warm showers if it needs to be in the Philippines because you gave. There are churches and families being assisted in Kentucky, and the story will go on as I get a chance to see further what's happening. My question to us this morning is, can we rejoice that as each of us do our little part, whether it's $5 or $5,000, as each of us do our little bitty part, something good is happening because God is taking us and making something great out of us. Good men have to be taught to do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they want to become. And so Paul says to two young pastors, teach them, teach them to do good. Now, 
just so we see the whole story, Paul then goes on to say in Romans 12, verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, buy him lunch. Win him over with kindness. For your surprising generosity will reawaken his conscience or will awaken his conscience and God will reward you with favor. Never let evil defeat you, but defeat evil with good. This is not a political statement, so please listen carefully. A lot of people have asked me the question. I got asked this question by someone last week. He says, why do you think in the midst of such a roaring economy, what do you think with the foreign policy? Why do you think President Trump wasn't reelected? I said, for me, it's pretty simple. President Trump may like the teachings of Jesus, but President Trump constantly chose to belittle and call names of those that disagreed with him, even his friends. And you never conquer evil with evil. You conquer evil with good. Now, I could be wrong on that, but I'm not wrong on that principle. I could be wrong on, on Trump's election. I may not understand politics as well as I think I understand politics, but I'm not wrong on that principle. Everybody's name has to be safe in your mouth at all times. You can deal with problems without assassinating character. And the Bible says, rather than try to punish your enemy or hurt your enemy, buy him lunch. Do something good for those. And you say, well, they're going to suspect that I've got some underlying uh, 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 motive for doing it. Of course I have underlying motive. I want to see them give their hearts to Jesus Christ and make heaven their home and not bust hell wide open. Is that good enough for you? That's what I want to see. I make no bones about it with any of my friends. I want to see them come to Jesus. I want to see them come to Christ. And so that leads me to the third point if you're going to leave a good life story is share the story of God's goodness with joy. So when your enemy asks you, just tell him, you know, this is how Jesus taught me to live. I know we've got problems. I know that we have differences. I know, but you see, my, my treasure is not in this job. My treasure is not in this subdivision. My treasure is in heaven, and therefore it affects how I live my life on my job and in my subdivision or in my marriage. My only, under, my only underlying motive is God has been so good to me. God forgave my sins, and, and Jesus came. That's what Christmas was all about, and you share with joy the story God has put into your life. In Psalms 145 and verse 7, David writes, everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness, and they will sing with joy about your righteousness. Oh, friends, did you sing with joy this morning? Did you sing with joy those powerful songs? And for those of you that need prayer this morning, I felt the Holy Spirit just really saying, you know, for those who need special prayer, we're going to pray with you right after the service this morning. But did you sing with joy about the miracles that God does in her life? I know evangelism is very, very uncomfortable. I know that people get Nancy when I talk about this, but... I, if I could get you to think the way I've tried to teach this church to think for over 20 years, think about evangelism differently. Evangelism is not a guilty person going out to get rid of his guilt and somebody listening to us because they feel guilty. Evangelism is just simply telling our lives and learning how to tell it in just a minute or two about God's goodness to you and doing it with joy. I find people always want to listen. They want to hear you. I want to know your story. They want to hear your story. You see, when we abandon our rights, when we give up our reputation, when we give up the fear of what people think about us, and when we start anticipating that God is going to do something, look at me in the eye, don't miss this church, don't miss this online, friends. I'm always anticipating that moment. When my daddy took in a new field, the soil was hard. Sometimes trees had to be cleared, stumps had to be pulled out. 
You broke it up. You kept breaking it up. You kept breaking it up. You kept breaking it up. You brought in what was needed to make the land. There was one piece of land he took in that everybody said nothing will ever grow there. Daddy made that one of the greenest pastures ever. But he bought in truckload after truckload of, of river muck that he put in there and manure that he put in there. And he cultivated that. And then I remember when he sowed it and when he sowed it, I saw all of this broadcasting that he did. I saw it come up and green grass and he let it be covered and, and then he would take that field and he'd watch it for weeds he'd keep it fertilized until finally one day he planted a crop in there that grew and he harvested the crop. It's not an overnight deal we have to give up our rights and spend our lives doing good anticipating the moment that someone is going to respond with the same kind of joy that you and I responded with when we gave our hearts to Christ. The Bible says in Psalms 40 and verse 2, talking about that hard soil, he lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire, and he set my feet on solid ground, and he steadied me as I walked along. He's given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God, and many will see what he has done and be amazed and read the last sentence with me. They will put their trust in the Lord. Would you say that again? They will put their trust in the Lord. I want you to stand with me. I want to pray with you. And I've given you a lot of growth work to do here at the end of the message. After we pray, you can go home. If you'll follow my blog this week, I'm going to talk to you about creating a life plan. I'm going to talk to you about how to write a life plan and how to prepare it. Next week, I'm going to talk to you about how we use our money to do good. The week following that, I'm going to talk to you about how we use our time and our talent to do good. Then we have a special guest speaker coming at the end of the month. And then I'm going to do one more message on what to anticipate when you breathe your last breath, when you spend a life doing good. Oh, you'll not be saved by your good works. But what you can expect when you spent your life doing good, when you breathe that last breath and you realize, I won't get to tithe again. I won't get to make lunch plans with a non-Christian friend again. I won't get to share the gospel again. I, I won't get to have another Christmas with my church Christmas Eve. What to expect when you breathe that last breath? And then we're going to come back after that very prophetic message. And I don't use that lightly. That very prophetic message. And we're going to talk about faithfulness in our marriage and family. And then we're going to talk about the faithfulness of Jesus Christ as he made his way to Calvary for you and I. And then we're going to look at, come the spring, the rewards of living a faithful life. The Bible says that he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I'm not talking about being good enough. When I was a young Christian, and I've shared this here at the church many times, when I was a young Christian, as a young person, I asked myself this question. Now, I don't mean this with any disrespect, so please listen. I really didn't like church people. I couldn't understand why my non-Christian friends were so much more likable than church people were. The kind of people that I grew up around, they were grim, they were glum, they were critical, and they loved to present an appearance of how holy they were. But my lost friends were helpful and happy, cheerful. I couldn't understand that. And a matter of fact, even as a young pastor, even though I knew that I was called, my wife's right here at this keyboard, if you can bring her in the picture. You remember when I almost quit the ministry as a young man. I almost quit the ministry because of the critical gripers that I was constantly meeting. Matter of fact, I did. I went, I had a full scholarship to the University of Georgia. I went to see if I could still get it. They were giving it to me. And then I got a call from a happy pastor, from a joyful pastor. And we took one more gamble and one more shot. 
And we met a group of people who showed us what the joy of the Lord was all about. And I remember one grumbling saint saying that didn't go to this church, but I had a lot of respect for because they knew the Bible, but they didn't know grace. They were a walking encyclopedia, but they didn't know grace. They didn't know joy. I never saw them smile until just before they died. And then I went to see them and talk to them. And in this church where people were joyful and people were being saved and people were laughing, that grim, glum saint said, I'd never trust a happy church. Let me tell you something. If you're a holy church, you will be a happy church. Can you say amen? When you give your heart to Jesus, he will bring joy unspeakable and full of glory into your life. Let me pray for you. Father, we want to live a good life, a godly life. We want to live a holy life, Lord, because as you teach us holiness, it's all about love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and self-control. And God, when we read that, we, we see, Lord, what an abysmal loss, how horrible sin is. It shatters me to think about what sin did to our lives, to our world. It shatters me to even remember when I hold that cup and that bread, what sin did to Christ so that we could be saved and know joy. So I ask you in the holy name of Jesus, would you reach out by your grace and draw hurting hearts to you this morning, hearts that have given up, hearts that will commit themselves to you, Lord, and become a part of the body of Christ, not just loving the teachings of Jesus, but becoming a passionate follower of Christ, I pray. Now make us all messengers as we leave this place. Now, before you move, I really prayed hard for you this week. Every single morning this week, I prayed for you. And if you're not a Christian, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Say, Heavenly Father, I want to be your son, your daughter, whatever it is. My heart is shattered over what my sin did to Christ. My sin did it too. It's not just your sin, but it's my sin. And I ask you to forgive me and to come into my life and change me and make me a passionate follower of Jesus Christ, I pray in your name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. May the Lord bless this week with joy and holiness and happiness. May he write your story with his own finger upon your heart. And may everywhere you go and everyone you touch be blessed and prospered because they've been in your presence. God bless you. Go in peace this morning. If you need special prayer, please come down right over here. I'd love to pray with you before you go today. 